Well, it is a huge year for India, the presidency of the G20 process. We're actually looking at the B20 process today. That's Business 20. It involves business leaders, uh, economic leaders from around the world, talking about the future of growth uh, across the world and certainly in the G20 group of nations. We've got a wonderful guest with us, uh, Borger Brenda with us, the president of the World Economic Forum. Thanks sir, uh, very much for being with us. Great to see you in India, not Davos. A little bit warmer over here, I, I, I suspect. Um, but let's talk a little bit about what the B20 agenda is. And one of the key issues is resilient global trade. And I think this is important because we've had problems with the Ukraine war. Uh, food price volatility is a huge problem. Energy price volatility is another huge problem. How is B20 addressing that? So you're right that uh, even if uh, a country like India is seeing uh, historic high growth, uh, there are challenges related to soaring food prices, uh, but also the energy prices. And these are global challenges, too, that uh, the G20 needs to look at. Um, we have food insecurity now in uh, many places uh, in the world. How is it possible to make sure that Ukraine, that is one of the largest producers of wheat, can continue their export? And then uh, on the oil and gas side, we know that uh, the gas prices have been uh, very high. And this is due to LNG, Europe now importing a lot of um, LNG to replace the Russian import. But uh, this means that many developing countries and, uh, and also emerging economies that were buying LNG before cannot afford it anymore because Europe is pay paying such a high price. But at the same time, we're seeing that the second largest economy in the world, China is growing much slower yes. and they're the biggest importer of oil and gas in the world. So that can also lead to, and the deflation that China is now seeing can also lead to less demand for this product. So let's see. Digitalization is an area where India has invested in greatly. Uh, and I think, you know, just as an observer, the digital back end has really come together now. There were a lot of skeptics, we were skeptics, that what will this actually achieve? Can you link digitalization to growth? But it does appear to be working in several areas. Do you believe it's a model that can be replicated? I hope so. You know, the fact that 1.4 billion people have their own digital identity, that almost 1.4 billion people are on their cells and uh, at affordable prices, if you have a cell phone, you have an ID number, and you also have a telephone number, you can also then establish your own bank account. You can wire money. This is a prerequisite for growth, inclusion, and poverty eradication. You know, it's uh, such a staggering number for India, because if you look globally, close to 4 billion out of 7 billion are not connected digitally uh, in uh, adequate way uh, and the prices are too high and uh, not affordable. So look at, well, you know, for India, this is a huge benefit, a huge driver of growth. So I think the fact that India now has a growth between um, six, seven, eight percent, it's the fastest growing economy in the world of the big ones. And it has been three consecutive years now. And also, uh, what is another staggering number is that if you look at what India contributes of global growth, 18% of all global growth now comes from India. This is incredible. So I think one of the driving factors behind this increased productivity is the digital um, uh, strength of this country and other countries should learn from India. Climate change is a concern. We've been speaking about it in Davos now for the last several years. Uh, but it's not just for governments to adopt climate change policies. Of course, that's important. It's also for companies. It's also for uh, people across the world. Uh, I mean, we're talking about B20. But how is the World Economic Forum really focused on climate change as a core agenda for you? So uh, many of the leading companies in the world are partners of the World Economic Forum. So we have formed different public-private partnerships and alliances. So we have, for example, an alliance that we started in 2014 where we have 120 Fortune 300 companies. These CEOs have committed to make sure that their company is net zero by 2050. 
And among these companies, there's also hard to abate sectors. We have aluminum companies, we have cement companies, uh, we also have uh, fertilizer companies. Uh, so that's uh, one example. Then we have another initiative uh, called the First Movers Coalition, where we have 88 companies, also several Indian companies. And what these companies have promised to do is to use their purchasing powers, because these are huge conglomerates, many of them. And they say, if we buy aluminum or if we buy steel in the future, more of it has to be green. And then they create a demand for green steel, green aluminum, green shipping, uh, green fertilizers, green cement. This is very, very powerful. So these are some like practical initiatives that we have taken. And I think private sector sends a strong message. The paradox though, is that there is too little happening in the decarbonization still uh, globally. And the misunderstanding here is that people say, oh, it's too expensive. But the reality is that the cost of climate change now is much higher uh, than uh, those initiatives. So the cost of inaction far exceeds the cost of action, but still not happening. It should be common sense, but common sense is not common. Yeah. No, and you're quite right, um, because the concern, for example, in green hydrogen for years has been it's too expensive. How are you going to do it? What are we going to do to make it safe, etc., etc.? But if you have the scale, which the world truly does, then it is a natural solution. Uh, do you believe we are moving fast enough around the world and in the G20 in adopting green technology like green carbon, uh, green hydrogen? Not fast enough. Uh, I think uh, the G20 presidency of India has put a lot of uh, pressure on the different nations here and also on the, uh, on the industries. But we should be inspired with what happened with solar and wind. Look at solar, it was 10 times more expensive 10 years ago. Wind was seven times more expensive. And today, most places in the world, solar is the most competitive energy source without any kind of subsidies. But how can we scale green hydrogen? How can we scale blue hydrogen? How can we scale carbon capture and storage uh, that can be a great bridge uh, for the uh, time uh, being? Even natural gas is much better than, uh, sure. than coal. So we need to be uh, much more innovative and we have to be much more practical. One or two more questions, upskilling and reskilling according to new jobs which are available. I mean, AI is one area where people suggest that, look, people will end up losing jobs. I'm not necessarily sure that's true, but there are concerns. And as we evolve globally, as a global economy, people need to be reskilled. Again, how is that something that possibly concerns the WEF and the B20? It's a big concern because uh, there are jobs there, but uh, one cannot find people with the right skills. So you have to right skill and you have to upskill. And uh, I, for example, in India, you will see a lot of growth in the ICT sector, also related to AI. And I agree with you. I think AI will kill some existing jobs, but there are also huge opportunities in the years to come. You know, for every new technology that we have introduced since the Industrial Revolution, the new technology initially kills jobs, but then we see it increases the productivity, we all get richer and more prosperous, and it creates more interesting and new jobs. And I don't think AI represents any change from this, but it is even a more revolutionary technology than we have seen for some time. Maybe we have to go back to the internet or uh, today's kind of breakthroughs. That's how consequential AI will be. But for, for example, India and some emerging economies to really benefit from the technology opportunities here, you have to have the people with the right skills. So you urgently have to reskill and upskill. And the World Economic Forum, we have no, develop different initiatives, uh, accelerators for upskilling and right skilling. We said that we want to upskill and right skill a billion people by 2030. And already those initiatives that we have taken with private sector has upskilled 400 million people. So we're also working very closely with the uh, Indian government on this uh, and uh, we're ready to do our part. A final question, India is now the most populous nation in the world um, and that comes with a unique set of challenges. Obviously upskilling is a key issue. But do you believe that India's growth prospects in the future will be driven by our demographic dividend? Yes, indeed. 
India is very privileged. Most countries now see a sinking workforce. India will be uh, in uh, positive supply for the next 30 years. And we see other countries then uh, really, really the working uh, population is going down. The expenses for pensions are going up. So they're also in big fiscal challenges. India has 50% of its population under 27 years old. This is also part together with the digital uh, revolution that has happened in this country. Also the increased infrastructure investments, also the increased investments uh, in uh, other uh, reforms, uh, making trade easier between different states, less bureaucracy, less red tape, uh, more uh, transparency when it comes to collecting taxes. All this comes together like in a perfect mix, so you have the snowball effect. Uh, so the snowball is rolling, the snowball is getting bigger and bigger, and is rolling faster and faster. That's India today. Wonderful speaking to you, sir. As Thank always, you. it's a great conversation. But um, it is fascinating what Mr. Brenda actually has to say about India demographic dividend. But the G20 is also a huge international opportunity for countries well beyond India to look at some of these key areas, upskilling, reskilling. Uh, there's healthcare, digitalization as well. It is a mammoth challenge which countries need to really come uh, up around the world and address.